This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. An underdog is a person or group in a competition, usually in sports and creative works, who is largely expected to lose. That is the definition you'll find on Wikipedia. The fable of David and Goliath, found in the Old Testament, is the classic story of overcoming seemingly impossible odds, achieving the unthinkable. But for fans of motorsports, the unthinkable can also become reality. Sebastian Vettel is a Grand Prix winner for the first time. He's the youngest ever, and that's one of the greatest things I've ever seen in Grand Prix racing. And Michael McDowell from Glendale, Arizona, for Bob Jenkins Front Row Motorsports, has won the Daytona 500. How about that? Brad Binder has just won the Austrian Grand Prix for Red Bull KTM. Team Minardi were often known as the perennial underdogs during their tenure in Formula 1 between 1985 and 2005. Starting off as a small family-run team, they became well-liked in the paddock for their friendly and open approach, as well as their tendency to occasionally punch above their weight. Their level of performance was often seen as a reflection of their lack of budget rather than a lack of ability. And despite the financial struggles, they tended to not lean too much into pay drivers who could bring in some quick cash, instead preferring to sign up-and-coming talents such as Giancarlo Fisichella, Jano Trilli, and even Fernando Alonso. When the team was sold to Australian businessman Paul Stoddart in 2001, this goodwill still carried through. The team was sold again in 2006 to Red Bull and entirely rebranded, despite the objection of some fans. But the Minardi spirit lived on in the newly named Toro Rosso, and when the team took an emphatic victory at the 2008 Italian Grand Prix, with a young Sebastian Vettel at the wheel, it was hard not to feel like everything had come full circle. It was a victory earned not through luck, but with pure speed and strategic decision. It was the same tenacity and opportunism that made the old Minardi so well loved. But not every underdog story can have a fairy tale ending. In fact, most do not. If you've ever played Gran Turismo, you will be aware of Super GT. It's a Japanese multi-class racing series boasting some of the fastest sports cars anywhere in the world, but more importantly, some of the most unpredictable racing as well. Started in 1993 or 1994, depending on who you ask, until 2005, Super GT was known as the All Japan Grand Touring Car Championship or JGTC for short, and has spawned countless numbers of iconic cars, such as the Castrol Supra, and the Castrol NSX, and also the Castrol GTR. Okay, a lot of them were sponsored by Castrol, but there were plenty of others that weren't, and will be instantly familiar to many of us who were part of the PlayStation generation. But alongside the more recognisable cars and teams, the other side of Super GT has always been about the oddballs. From obscure one-off models like the ASL Garaya, Mooncraft Shiden, or various versions of the VMAC, to more well-known cars which just weren't expected, such as the formerly Group B Lancia 037, or the now infamous Prius, which at one point was powered by a V8 hybrid sourced from Toyota's LMP1 race cars. Unfortunately, due to a rule change in 2012, low-volume and one-off prototype cars were no longer allowed in Super GT. But what you'll notice is that the majority of these unusual cars were built for the second-tier GT300 class. In comparison, GT500 has almost always been the stronghold of the big three – Honda, Nissan, and Toyota. In fact, the last time a car from outside of those three manufacturers even took part in GT500 was 2009. But what if there was an outsider? One who could take the fight to the big three? Not just turn up occasionally for a few races here or there, but actually commit to the series long term with the goal of disrupting the natural order? Well, this is where the story of the Japanese Lamborghini Owners Club comes in.
Let's talk about Lamborghini's Formula One project. Lamborghini had supplied engines for a couple of years prior to this, even achieving a third place at the 1990 Japanese Grand Prix with the Guri Suzuki at the wheel of the V12 powered LaRousse. But for 1991, they would enter with their own works team, sort of. Modena, originally known as GLAS, contacted Lamborghini to not only supply them with V12 engines, but also design and build them a chassis to put them in. Although Lamborghini obliged and even offered financial support initially, they were keen to distance themselves somewhat, despite the car being known as the Lambo 291. Like most upstart F1 teams in the 80s and early 90s, they failed to qualify for most of their races and didn't achieve a whole lot, with Lamborghini stopping their support completely and the team folding by the end of the year. Although Lamborghini continued to supply engines to other teams for two more seasons, a proposed work supply with McLaren for 1994 failed to come to fruition, with the team choosing Peugeot Power instead, thus marking the end of Lamborghini's involvement in Formula 1. Now, over in Japan, the Japanese Lamborghini Owners Club, which I'll refer to as JLOC from now on, for the sake of brevity, was formed in 1980. As the name implies, it was a club for owners of Lamborghinis living in Japan. They dealt with all of the usual things you would find in an owners club, such as helping each other with the maintenance of their cars, mostly Lamborghini Miuras at that point, sourcing spare parts, and organising events. The chairman of JLOC was Isao Noritake, who is of course a Lamborghini owner, but also an avid fan of motorsport. It's very well known that Lamborghini has historically not had much impact in the world of racing. This was due to company founder, Ferruccio Lamborghini, viewing it as a waste of money and resources. In fact, prior to Formula One, the only Lamborghini race car with any level of factory involvement was the Countach QVX Group C prototype, that only competed in one official race. Noritake was briefly involved with the F1 project with LaRousse at the 1989 Japanese Grand Prix, and then saw his compatriot Aguri Suzuki's success with the team the following year. So when a fellow JLOC member by the name of Teruaki Terai proposed the idea of building their own race car for the new JGTC which had started in 1993, they set to work on the project. The original plan was to use a fire-damaged Countach as a basis to build the car from, but the project wasn't completed in time for the first race of the 1994 season at Fuji Speedway. After the JGTC organisers found out about this, they requested them to enter, so a deal was put together with Art Sports, a luxury car dealership, to supply another Countach to use. The deal was negotiated by Satoshi Ikazawa, the creator of the Circuit Wolf manga comic, and he would actually be signed as one of the team's drivers. Due to a lack of time, the car only had very basic modifications, but they would continue to use it for the rest of the season. It's not been documented what happened to the original Countach that they had planned to use. Anyway, the car was raced under the Ken Wolf with Tarai engineering name, with Noritake as the team manager, and during the season they achieved very little success. Due to its power, it was entered into the top class, then known as GT1, which was made up of an eclectic selection of cars, including genuine GT1 cars such as the Ferrari F40, an R32 GTR adapted from Group A regulations, the previously mentioned Lancia 037 which turned up for just a round 3, and even a Porsche 962C Group C prototype. These were very much the Wild West days of the JGTC, and even with that mixed bag of opponents, the Countach was still clearly outclassed. It failed to finish in 3 out of the 5 rounds, with a best result of 8th in the second round at Sendai. They would score 3 points on that, which sounds like a decent result, until you consider that there were only 11 cars entered in the GT1 category for that race, and they still finished behind 2 GT2 cars, which meant they were 10th overall. Joining Ikazawa in that first season was Takao Wada, a former works driver for Nissan's sports car program, and both would be retained for 1995. But not everything would stay the same. Over the winter, JLock requested Lamborghini to build them a new car for the season. This car would be the Lamborghini Diablo. This was the Diablo Jota. JLock actually ordered three of them, one to use in the JGTC, another to use in endurance races, and a third being a road car to homologate them to be used. But despite now having this purpose-built race car for the series, their results didn't improve. This was partly due to the strength of the GT1 field being higher in 1995. 
The main opposition were the Toyota Supras, Porsche 911 GT2s, and the Nissan GTRs, both the R32 and brand new R33 models. All this meant that the team would record a best finish of 13th, which they achieved twice. But the worst was to come off track for JLOC, with Teruaki Terai, the progenitor of the JGTC program, sadly succumbing to cancer partway through the year. The team would still race on with the Diablo Jota into 1996, facing even greater opposition. Team Go entered the series with the dominant McLaren F1 GTR, and Team Kunimitsu would field a Honda NSX GT2, marking both brands' first involvement in the series. The performance of these two cars, the McLaren in particular, which would go on to win four of the six races and the overall championship, would really highlight j -Lock's shortcomings. Despite being their third full season in the category, their results weren't much better than 1995. But for 1997, they had something up their sleeves. The previous year, Porsche had shocked the GT1 racing scene when it unveiled the 911 GT1. Given the requirements for GT1 homologation, the intended process was for manufacturers to build their GT1 car from an existing road car. Porsche flipped the script by designing it as a race car first and then converting it into a road car. This meant it could be designed without compromise, purely to go as fast as possible. Lamborghini could see the trend and wanted to get in on the action. So, they contacted Senior Advanced Technology to build them a purpose-built GT1 race car in the same vein as the 911 GT1. It was Diablo in name only, a completely original chassis that bared little resemblance other than the engine which was the same unit as the normal Diablo but bored out to 6 litres. It now made roughly 650 horsepower. But due to financial difficulties, Lamborghini decided to scrap the project after only two cars had been produced, one race car and one road car. The road car was kept by Signa until eventually being sold to Mistral Motors, an Italian car dealership. But the fate of the race car is far more interesting. The car was also sold, but to the Japanese Lamborghini Owners Club. How much it sold for and how they were able to afford this one-off prototype is unknown, but the bottom line was that JLock now had what was pretty much a brand spanking new GT1 car to contest in the JGTC. I don't think it gets appreciated how awesome this was. A stillborn race car that actually got to compete at a high level. This wasn't supposed to happen, and without JLock, it wouldn't have. The Ferrari F50 GT was another scrapped GT1 project, although Ferrari's contempt for the FIA allowing cars like the 911 GT1 was the reason it was cancelled instead of the reason it existed, like the Lamborghini. Six chassis were created, with three being sold privately and three unfinished chassis being destroyed. One was sold to well-known Ferrari collector Yoshikuni Okamoto. Funnily enough, the Ferrari Club of Japan did briefly race in the JGTC, but only in GT300, so the F50 GT was never raced in any official events. Anyway, j -Lock now had their new Diablo GT1 for the 1997 season, although they entered it under the Diablo GTR name, unrelated to the actual Diablo GTR unveiled in 1999. Takao Wada was partnered with Hisashi Wada, no relation, and spirits must have been high as they went into their first race at Fuji. Team Go and their McLarens had left the series after a dispute with the organisers regarding performance handicaps, but Honda had increased their involvement by developing a brand new GT500 car to fill that void. And the results were still lacklustre, with just two finishes across the season, a 14th and a 13th place. The Diablo GT1 had to be restricted to around 550 horsepower, which still meant it was the most powerful car in the class, but that didn't seem to help them. They were even beaten by a handful of aging 911 GT2s and once again scored zero points in the championship. But they did have one brief moment in the sun. Not during the championship, mind you, but at the post-season Motegi All-Star Race. In 1997, the Motegi circuit was newly constructed and would later become a fixture on the JGTC calendar. But until then, a one-off All-Star Race was hosted, but not on the road course, instead the oval speedway with some very clumsy chicanes inserted. Why they decided to do this, no one really knows, and it was never repeated ever again. But what this led to was a lot of carnage. The event took place over two races, and despite starting from dead last after having some reliability issues, j -Lock took an impressive ninth place finish. Let's just ignore the fact that there were only 10 GT500 cars classified. 
And more important was that the grid for race two was decided by the finishing order for race one, so they would start in ninth place. From there, they made a good start, getting up to the dizzying heights of seventh the power of their V12 finally proving its worth on this unusual circuit, as seemingly faster cars behind couldn't find a way past. That was right until the Denso Saad Supra was caught out braking for the first chicane. Both cars retired from the race with damage. Still, overall a decent showing, proving that there was at least some potential in the car. For 1998, Hisashi Wada was joined by Neohiro Furuya, the same driver who piloted the Lancia for one race in 1994. This season, the results were once again… decent? They scored two points finishes at Sendai and Motegi, meaning they were actually classified 16th in the team's championship. But sadly, looking at just the results doesn't tell the full story. Ninth at Sendai came by way of nine retirements in GT500 and finishing three laps down on the winner. Their 10th place result at the Motegi road course was even more fortuitous, with eight retirements, finishing seven laps behind the winner, and 21st overall when considering GT300. Ever wonder why back in the days of high attrition, many series would only award points down to sixth place? Yeah, this is why. So people couldn't just luck their way into the points. But JGTC awarded points down to 10th, and the GT500 grid never exceeded more than 20 cars. Still, a result is a result, and the same couldn't be said for the second car. That's right, JLOC entered two Diablos in 1998, and only 1998. The second car was raced under number 777 and was the old Diablo Jota which the team had previously campaigned, driven by Takao Wada and Masami Sugiyama. As expected, its results were pretty bad, competing in four races and only finishing two, with a best result of 13th struggling to beat even the GT300 cars. There's actually very little information about the 777 car, even on Wikipedia they just gloss over the fact it even raced in 1998. There's also very few images of it. This one is pretty much the only one I can find, and according to this Instagram post, it was later converted into a road car. But that leads me to my next topic, which is coverage. You see, despite being a fixture of the JGTC for so many years, there is surprisingly little footage of either Diablo from any season. For instance, I watched the JGTC season review videos from 1994 to 2002, posted on the Super GT YouTube channel, and recorded every time JLOC's cars could be seen clearly outside of the start of the race. And this was all I could find. Over two hours of video, JLOC's cars are shown on screen for a matter of seconds. This is the reason why I haven't shown much footage of the actual cars, because I simply cannot find much. The only times you ever do see it is when it's involved in an accident. Even in full race broadcast, it's rarely ever the focus because it's almost always trundling around in no man's land. And despite rarely ever being seen, it still managed to be even more overlooked in the later seasons. For 1999, not much happened, you can see their results here, and the same was true in the 2000 season. The only notable thing being that they managed to be a classified finisher in all seven races that season, a feat only managed by four other GT500 teams. Quite impressive when you consider the complex V12 engine and usual unreliability. But the most interesting thing about the 2000 car had nothing to do with its real life racing. You see, this wouldn't be one of my videos if we didn't talk about Gran Turismo. For many years, Gran Turismo had tried to get many premium European brands like Ferrari, Porsche and Lamborghini into their games. In Gran Turismo 2, tech strings for the 1997, 98 and 99 versions of the JLOC Diablo even existed in early versions of the game, along with many other cars in the JGTC at the time but sadly, due to licensing issues, they were never able to be implemented. That was until Gran Turismo 3. Despite these brands still not cooperating, Gran Turismo were able to sneakily license the 2000 Diablo directly through JLOC, branded as the JLOC Nomad Diablo with no mention of Lamborghini. Just ignore that the L in JLOC stands for Lamborghini. Despite meaning it can now feature in the game, Lamborghini caught wind of this and requested that it not appear in the game outside of Japan, so it was exclusive to the NTSCJ version of the game. 
It disappeared entirely for GT4, but then made a surprise return in all versions of GT5 once Gran Turismo and Sony were finally able to obtain the Lamborghini license. Something similar happened with the McLaren F1 GTR in GT4, which was branded under BMW. The story is that McLaren developed the F1 road car and then built it into the F1 GTR. In 1997, BMW would run the car as a works team under the banner BMW Motorsport owing to the fact that it was powered by the BMW S70 V12 engine. Even in Gran Turismo, the car is still branded as a BMW, as it has been in a few other games it's appeared in. Speaking of the McLaren F1 GTR, it had returned to GT500 in 1999, with Team Take One using the 1997 long tail version of the car and had scored middling results. Although in 2000, they did achieve an impressive fourth place finish at TI Circuit, now known as Okayama International. This proved that it was possible for big V12 GT1 cars to compete with the smaller and more nimble purpose-built GT500s from the big three. Just not the Diablo, for whatever reason. So in 2001, JLock made the decision to develop the Diablo GT1 into the Diablo J GT1. The chassis and suspension had been reworked, and new parts developed especially for GT500, including a new aero package. They failed to start round one in Okayama due to lack of preparation. Presumably its practice time of 15 minutes and 55 seconds had something to do with that. But when it did start, the results from drivers Furuya and Marco Apicella were not surprising. GT500 cars had evolved quite a lot from where they were in 1997, and the Diablo JGT1, still based on the chassis of the GT1, just wasn't going to cut it. But that doesn't explain how the McLaren F1 GTR managed to take a win at the season finale in Mine. So this really is the elephant in the room, the Italian V12 elephant. Why was the Diablo so consistently off the pace? JGTC and latterly Super GT are well known for their system of performance handicaps. Teams will be given additional ballast and air restrictors to reduce engine power based on their total points scored and previous results. What this leads to is an unpredictable series where almost anyone has the chance to win in theory. In the days of the JGTC, this was the most extreme, with teams being able to win the championship despite not winning a single race in the season. Something that's happened more than once, in fact. It also meant that teams would try and game the system by deliberately finishing in lower positions to give themselves a better chance in the final race. All of this was shown perfectly in the 2001 season, where Team Sarumo won the championship with one third place, two second places, and zero wins. And none of the top three teams in the championship scored points in the final race either. All of this helped Team Take One to take an impressive pole to win victory, because if it was going to happen at any race, it would probably be the final race of the season where all of the fast cars are heavy with ballast. And yet in that race, the Diablo was still nowhere qualifying at the back and finishing 15th, four laps down on the winners. And if you look at all of j results in the JGTC, there's no noticeable improvement later in any season. The reason why the JGTC had classes with power limits, GT500 and GT300, was all in the name of parity, so that teams and manufacturers couldn't just develop an overpowered engine and completely dominate. j was actually given special dispensation from this, hence why the car had roughly 550 horsepower, to make up for its deficiencies against the purpose-built GT500. But even at somewhere like the old Fuji Speedway, which was a very power sensitive track, their results were still very ordinary. Unlike the big three, j didn't really have the ability to develop the car much during the season. So my theory is that although they were benefiting from the handicaps applied to the other cars, this was offset by the other manufacturers developing their cars, so the performance gap was maintained. And the same could be true regarding their year-to-year -year performance also, although they were making improvements gradually, as can be seen from their relative lap times, as the GT500s became more sophisticated and higher downforce, it didn't appear like they were gaining. But of course, other international marks had appeared in GT500 and performed decently, so what was the difference? Well, let's consider the McLaren F1 GTR, given that it's the only non-Japanese car to have won the GT500 title, and still the last to have won a race. Before coming to the JGTC, the car was already a proven winner. It famously won at Le Mans in 1995, and then dominated the BPR Global GT Championship in the same year. 
it was a known quantity, and when Team Go picked up a couple to campaign in the JGTC in 1996, they had confidence in knowing all of this, which showed in their performance. Later, when the Longtail GTR returned to the series from 1999 onwards, so many cars had been built, 28 in total, and most of those raced competitively. The bottom line is that it's much easier to understand and set up a car which has been raced for several years by teams all over the world compared to a one-off prototype. And that was the issue for JLOC. They had to work it out themselves. And when you're a small, relatively inexperienced team, that is a massive undertaking. And who's to say that had the Diablo GT1 been fully developed and raced in Europe as intended, it would have been any good. Maybe it would have always been a dud. I guess JLOC had no way of knowing that. Despite the continued struggles and what must have been crushing disappointment of watching the McLaren take victory, the team persevered with the Diablo JGT1. 2002 was even more of a struggle, only finishing 2 out of 8 races and not even qualifying for the season opener. The only team to perform worse than them was HKS, who entered GT500 with a Mercedes CLK based race car. It competed at 5 events, failed to qualify for two of them, retired after a combined 10 laps in the next two, and then finished last and four laps down in its final appearance at Suzuka, before never being seen again. It served to underline how difficult it was to compete with the big three manufacturers and the sheer amount of investment needed. For 2003, the team switched from Dunlop to Yokohama tyres, but this didn't result in a change of fortunes. It was clear by this point that the Diablo had run its course. In 2003, the GT500 category saw some major regulation changes. These pertain to the use of pipe frame structures and more freely positioning the engine and gearbox. It all meant that the cars were now less production based and instead closer to fully fledged racing machines. As such, they became a lot faster. But the Diablo was now a six year old chassis. It just wasn't worth the hassle to redesign it and the potential would have been far lower than the new breed of GT500s anyway. The car struggled on through the year before being finally replaced with the Murcielago RGT, with the exception of one race in 2004 where it was brought out again due to a lack of spare parts for the Murcielago, but failed to qualify. It's also worth mentioning that outside of the JGTC, JLOC also raced the Diablo at the Suzuka 1000km event on a number of occasions. This was back in the day when it was a standalone event and attracted a very mixed field of cars. Regardless, they did have a GT500 class in which the Diablo was entered into. First the Diablo Jota in 1996, and then the GT1 from 2000 to 2003. The results were as expected, apart from the 2000 race, because due to there only being 8 cars in the top class and 5 of them failing to finish, the Diablo survived 6 hours of racing to take 3rd place overall. I mean, their speed had nothing to do with the results, but a podium is a podium, thus marking the only piece of silverware the Diablo ever won. But what if I told you that was not the Diablo's finest hour? And in fact, its true moment of glory has been completely forgotten due to a bizarre situation. Let's step back into that final 2003 season. Round 4 of the championship was supposed to take place overseas at the Sepang Circuit in Malaysia, which had become a normal fixture. However, due to the outbreak of the SARS virus in Asia, this would end up being cancelled. But it wasn't cancelled entirely. Instead, the event was relocated to Fuji Speedway, resulting in the interestingly named Malaysian JGTC in Fuji Speedway. But the name wasn't the only oddity, because the event format had also been changed. Due to Fuji hosting two other rounds in that season, the series organisers decided to shake up the formats by having two sprint races, one being 20 laps and the other being 30 laps, each done with a single driver per car. Race 1 started with a wet track and with the Diablo right at the back, as was customary. But what JLock and a handful of other teams decided to do was start the race on slick tyres in the hopes that the track would dry out quick enough for it to be worthwhile. In the early laps, the Diablo with Hisashi Wada at the wheel was predictably rooted to the back. But as the track got drier and drier, the Diablo got faster and faster. For once, it was actually being seen on the TV broadcast as it battled with the other cars. I'm sure the sponsors were happy. At half race distance it had made its way up to 11th and by the end of the 20 lap race it had reached an incredible, by their standards, 8th place. That may not sound better than 3rd overall at the Suzuka 1000km but the big difference was that there was not a single retirement in the 18 car GT500 field. 
they had legitimately beaten 10 other cars, including all 5 of the Honda NSXs. They had equaled their best ever JGTC finish when all the odds were against them. But this result was almost completely forgotten, even by the record books. How? Well, two other cars which started on slick tyres were the Denso Saad Supra and the VMAC, and they kind of stole the Diablo's thunder. Like the Diablo, they spent the first half of the race near the back, but then started to fly as the track dried out. The VMAC RD350R was a purpose-built race car run by R&D Sports that was underpowered compared to the other GT500s. 2003 would be its only full season in the top class, before stepping down to GT300 and racing various versions of the car through to 2012. It had initially run behind the Diablo, but eventually got past and reached as high as 4th place. It ultimately finished an incredible fifth, only fractionally behind the top three. If the race had been only a lap longer, it surely would have got on the podium. But the Denso Supra in particular went on a charge. It had run as low as 14th at one point, but managed to finish an incredible second, passing the VMAC on the penultimate lap, and then ruining the all Nissan top three by passing both Nismo cars in the dying moments. Something which went unseen by the TV cameras. One, two, three, finish. Regardless, for J-Lock, it was a great result, and even better was that much like the Mategi All-Star Race in 1997, the starting grid for Race 2 was the finishing order of Race 1. Koji Yamanishi took over the car for race 2, which started in heavy wet conditions, and he battled valiantly with the other GT500s on the first lap. It was all going well, until the start of lap 2, when this happened. Ah, the Raybrig NSX, driven by Hidetoshi Mitsusada, aquaplaned out of control and went over the grass at turn 1, causing the Diablo to crash into it unsighted. What made it even more dangerous was that the NSX had aquaplaned right at the same place where emergency vehicles were attending to two GT300 cars which came to blows on the first lap. Regardless, the result was all the same for J-Lock. But the implications of this were more important. You see, the way this round worked was that the results of both races were combined and then teams awarded points based on them, rather than each race being considered individually. What this meant was that JLOC's combined result for this round was 16th, which funnily enough was actually their worst classified result in the whole season. So they came away from that round with a wrecked car and nothing to show for it. On paper, the Diablo had been a failure. There's no question about it, it had entered 53 races in total and only scored points twice, and both of those times were mainly down to attrition. But the impact of the j -Lock Diablo is the legacy it left behind. When the Diablo GT1 entered the series in 1997, GT500 cars looked like this. By the time it left at the end of 2003, they looked like this. Beyond the big three, no other team or manufacturer has had as much representation in GT500. For instance, starting in 2004, Hitotsuyama Racing, who previously raced an F1 GTR in the series, would campaign a Ferrari 550 GTS, another big V12 Italian GT1 car. The results were predictably not great, entering 15 events across two seasons and registering a best finish of 12th, and by the end of 2005, they stopped competing in GT500. Team Go had plans to return to the series with another European GT1 car, the Maserati MC12, in 2006. Despite the car proving very capable in GT1 competition and having an all-star driver lineup of Seiji Ara and Jan Magnussen, they pulled out of the series after pre-season testing due to its poor performance relative to the GT500s. And the final non-Japanese car to compete in GT500 to this day was an Aston Martin DBR9 from Team Nova. They turned up for three races in the 2009 season and finished 14th in each of them. 
It has to be mentioned that in the mid to late 90s, GT500 cars were a lot more similar to GT1s than they would be throughout the 2000s. The two sets of regulations gradually diverged as time went on until it reached a point where GT500 cars had just become so specialised that they existed as their own niche. The point was further hammered home when in 2010, Honda finally replaced its car based on the first gen NSX with the HSV-010, an experimental design based on a prototype of a front-engined NSX that was never produced. This was mostly due to the GT500 regulations only allowing front-engine cars at that time, and Honda not having a production model they could actually use. But that's a story for another day. The point is that GT500 cars had become closer to Le Mans prototypes than actual production-based GT cars as the name suggested, and in current day that's only become more true. Unless a new manufacturer decides to build a purpose-built GT500 car, something like the JLock Diablo will never happen again. So the Diablo GT1 was a complete oddity. The fact that it achieved so little success is honestly kind of irrelevant. Just the fact that it existed and was racing in Japan was enough for it to become a cult legend. The big V12 Raging Bull was nothing like the other cars in GT500, or anything raced anywhere else in the world for that matter. Because it was one of one, the only Diablo GT1 Stradale race car that existed. The sheer tenacity of J-Lock to not only try and compete in GT500, but to purchase this bespoke, unproven, prototype race car and then race it regularly for seven consecutive seasons when it was clear that it was never going to be able to match its rivals has to be applauded. So when you consider everything, it's no surprise that it became the fan favourites. I believe that it's good to take risks, because life would be so less interesting if people didn't. But it's sadly not always viable. For 2006, JLock would switch over to GT300 full time, and on the number 88 car's first ever race in the class, they won. Convincingly. It's also good to know your limits. More than anything, this proved that J-Lock were capable, in case their GT500 exploits made you think otherwise. Yeah, the win is important, we changed the class because in 500 we were not competitive. We are very competitive in 300 and we today we demonstrate we are very strong and the Lamborghini is very important for the sport I think. So I think also for Japan it's important to be here. Thank you very much. Truthfully, I'm really not sure how JLock managed to operate for so long, achieving nothing, not even being classified in the championship for most seasons. But to see them finally succeed, albeit in the lower class, was gratifying nonetheless. And GT300 is where they still compete to this day. That first race may have been a bit of a false dawn, since they've only taken two more wins in the 17 years since then, and a best result of 7th in the championship. But their ambitions still showed through. In both 2007 and 2012, JLock entered up to four cars at selected rounds, when most GT300 teams only entered one, and on a couple of occasions they even achieved double podiums in the class. JLock is certainly not a team that rests on their laurels, but the days of the Diablo are a long way in the past. It's funny, looking at the Diablo and considering it as the underdog, because from an outside perspective, you would never know. It was a big Italian supercar going up against much smaller, less powerful Japanese sports cars. But that surface level description doesn't begin to explain the depths of the challenge JLock faced in those days. It was a David that looked like a Goliath. Possibly the worst combination. As I said, most underdogs do not get the fairy tale ending, and that's partially because when it comes to sports, there is no ending. Immediately after the 2008 Formula 1 season, where they grabbed that shock win, Toro Rosso finished dead last in the 2009 standings. Since then, there have been many ups and downs, including even another win, but currently the team, now named Alpha Tauri, again finds themselves last in the Formula 1 World Championship. But a complete refresh for 2024 opens a world of opportunities, so who knows where their story will go. As for JLock, who are still managed by Isao Noritake, they recently just received a brand new Lamborghini Huracan Evo 2, so it remains to be seen if they can turn around their fortunes also. I'll be honest here, I've never been a particularly big fan of Lamborghini, I'm much more of a Ferrari man myself, but I can't help but love JLock. 
So, if you happen to catch a Super GT race in the future, which you should because they're awesome, just remember this video. The story of how those red, white and green Huracan GT3s came to be has a lot to do with this Diablo. The car that achieved nothing, but was loved by everyone. Thank you if you watched all the way through. This video is completely different to what I normally make about racing games, but motorsport is also one of my massive passions, and this is a story that I don't think has received enough attention. It wasn't the easiest to put this video together, since not a huge amount of background information has been documented, and of course a lot of the coverage was in Japanese. Despite that, I really enjoyed making this, and I hope all of you enjoyed watching it. If this gets enough support, I'll definitely make more videos like it. Highlighting forgotten stories and oddities is what I live for, making videos that I think deserve to exist. I enjoy taking risks, so in that sense, I guess I've got a little bit in common with JLock myself. Anyway, have a good one.